All right. How many of you have written racket programs before? All right. Seven or eight. Racket, racket. How about scheme programs? Anyone written a scheme program? Lisp? It's got almost. Uh, any JavaScript? All right, close enough. Okay. Um, so we're going to write a lot of racket code today. Let's see. Um, with the aim of getting to something that doesn't look like racket, um, except for the hashlang QL part. So that's the real, that's the core racket syntax. Hashlang something and everything else can be whatever you make it. So here I've made it this query language that is a, um, you know, a language work workbench uh, kind of benchmark where um, someone else defined this language for uh, GUI forms. So you, know, you can see there's some field names and then some text and some types. And when you run this program, uh, then it pops up a little GUI window. And when you click this, then those other things appear. And when I type 100 here and 1 here, then it subtracts them and so on. So all of that is being able to specify these kinds of surveys is what this language QL is for. Okay, so if you know anything about Racket or Scheme or Lisp, uh, then you may have expected more parentheses. And in fact, we'll kind of get to this as the very last step because, uh, yes, most of the interesting part is here in parenthesized form. So we'll work our way towards this version, and then I'll talk, um, talk about that last step. Okay, so this, if I run it, it just does the same thing. Okay. But even before getting that far, then I'll just give you a crash course in Racket. We'll talk about macros, do some simpler exercises, and then start building up this, uh, this survey language. Okay. So, uh, and if you got the, if you got the Git repo, you'll find outline.txt. This is, as far as I know, what I'm going to talk about, uh, and essentially the order, and then the exercises are in that file too. Oh, and if you installed Racket and you started up the first time, then you'll see something more like this. Um, it will claim it doesn't know what language you want to use, because there are these different languages. Uh, so what you do is you can click Get Guidance, and then click the big logo, and then take the default action. And that'll add hashlang racket to the top. And then after you click Run, then it'll be OK, and you can type expressions down there. OK, okay so uh, you see the environment has these two windows where generally I'll type programs here and work interactively down there. Right? And so I'll sort of use a mixture of it as we go. Numbers, one is a number, 1.5 is a number, 3 fourths is a number. So if you make a program that has those three things in it, you get what you expect, you get those numbers back. Uh, we'll need some strings that work exactly the way you expect them to. Um, Booleans are the first slightly strange one. True is written hash t, and false is hash f. So all of those things are just literal values. We can uh, put things together in a list using um, it's okay using uh, the list function so in this notation when we call a function we put the parenthesis before the function name and then all the arguments and don't bother with commas so that makes the list one two three and it prints out a little strangely I'll come back and talk about why it prints that way in a little bit but you can just read that as the list that contains the numbers one two and three we could put a string there instead okay. Um, we can uh, apply functions like plus to one and three. So again, I said you put the function name with the parenthesis before it, so that's why it's open parenthesis plus one and three. Plus is just the name of the function. And besides list, what else will we need? We may need vectors. A vector is like a list and prints pretty similarly. The only difference is um, when we have a vector, then we can change the content on it using something like vector set. Right? So there's zero based indexing. So if I change that vector, I forgot to give it a value. So at position one, I put in a zero. And so that's why the vector is now one, zero, three, because this was at position one. Okay, vector set assigns to it. Vector ref looks up something. Okay. So nothing's too surprising right now, right? It's just uh, the basic notation. Any questions there? Yeah. 
I just had a question to the, how, to, how to get it to the one. How, how to get it to do what? How to get, so whatever you're writing down, how to get the, the uh, evaluation of this. Oh, I see. Uh, you can click the run button. I think I keep hitting command R, or I hit F5 more likely. Right. And you can type most of these things down here too if you prefer. I think it's just easier to see up there. Another question. It's parenthesized prefix notation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. All That's right. So everything is parenthesized prefix notation. Yeah. Until we change it. But uh, but we'll we'll generally stay with that notation. Anything else? Okay, you can see I've started using define already, where I said define v is the value of this expression. I could define three to be plus one two. And so, of course, when I evaluate 3, either using it above or below, and it prints out 3. So that's a define with no parenthesis around the names, defines a constant. What are these uh, arrows that keep showing up? Uh, so the arrows is trying to tell me where define came from. So the define form itself was imported from Racket. Oh, I yeah, as, as was anything I'm using so far. Except 3, if I type it here uh, and spell it correctly, then 3 came from right there. Now, if I want to make a function, that's also with define. Um, so I could say the add one function takes a number and adds one to that number. So if I call add one to five uh, and run that, then I get six. So you see this is a define with parentheses. Um, and then I use it the same way I defined it there. I use add one with one argument five in place of the end and so on. And really, this is a shorthand for writing define add one to be the function that takes one argument and then adds one to the argument. So same as in JavaScript in many languages now, um, a lambda is just an anonymous procedure, and we spell it the traditional way like that. Any questions here? OK. Yes. Uh, yeah, the question was, are there any square brackets here? They're just parentheses. Yeah. So, uh, does it make a difference between an argument that he has to evaluate and a uh, variable name? Is it your duty? Sorry, what, what was that again? How do you, does it make a difference between n, which is a name, and the, the fact that it should evaluate uh, to a number? Uh, so uh, I think your question is, is, does the name somehow mean that it's a, a number? or <laughs> It's an argument because... Um, it's after lambda and the parens, and these are the arguments to the anonymous function. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's lambda that makes a function here, right? And when, but often I'll write it this way as a shorthand. That that means the same thing. So this says add one is a function that takes an n, and adds one to n. Okay, um, sometimes I may need local bindings. And for that, I might sometimes write let like this. So that just says let n be 5 in the body of the let. And then the reason there are so many parentheses here is because I can do multiple ones at a time. So I could be say n is 5, and f is the function, the identity function. And I'll use it like that. Okay. So these square brackets, you can use parentheses if you want. It doesn't matter. but I, you'll see I use square brackets in certain places by convention. Okay. So that would be adding, oops, wrong button. So there I'm adding 5 to the identity function applied to 5, which is 10. Other questions? And the let is? Uh, it is a non-recursive let. So if I try to refer to in here, then I'll get an error there. Yeah, uh, but it's no, it's not even sequential. I can't refer to in here either. It's sort of parallel that. Yeah. And there are other forms, but I don't think I'll use them. I'll just stick to this one. Okay. Um, so we have lists and functions. So of course we have things like map. So if I wanted to square all of the numbers in a list of numbers, then it would be like that. So I'm mapping that function that squares 
takes an x and returns x times x. Map it over the list, four, five, six. And quit hitting the wrong key. Uh, then I get 16, 25, 36. And there are various other functions that work like map. There's a fold L and a fold R, uh, all the ones that you would expect. Uh, and finally, so we have all these built-in data types, like numbers and strings and lists. But if you want your own kind of structures, then that is with the struct form. So if I say struct posin, then I am declaring a new kind of data um, constructed with posin. And then I'll say x and y here. That means a posin has two parts. So if I say posin 3, 4 now, um, then it just printed out that it is a posin. Uh, so after, if you create a posin, you need ways to get things back. There are various pattern matching forms available, but the simplest way to pull the x part back out is to use the posin hyphen x function. So when you say struct posin and then x and y, it defines a bunch of things. Uh, it defines this posin constructor here, and it takes the name posin and this name x and puts a hyphen in between them and defines that function. And so posin hyphen x is defined by this posin declaration, and uh, of course posin hyphen y is also there. And I don't think we need it, but uh, there's also a posin question mark. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, this posin question mark says, is it a posin? And so that one is a posin, whereas a string is not a posin. Those are true and false, right? So, and the usual and true and false is, is false, and not false is true, and so on. So if you, uh, if you don't know the name of something, you can guess. Uh, if you guess close enough but not right, then what you can do is leave the caret, the, the flashing cursor there, and hit probably F1 on your machine, and it'll open documentation and search in the documentation for you. So in general, you can click on something and hit F1, or you can uh, go into the help menu and select racket documentation to get to a, a search page. Right? And it's all local on your machine. Um, I think that's all the basics. Well, we might need a couple of more things. So uh, for the kinds of things we're doing, we might need some hash tables. I know we'll need hash tables. Uh, so a hash table, it's really dictionary, would be a better name. Um, so you can create one with hash. So this maps x to 1 and y to 2. Okay. So if I run it, it just says that's a hash table. Um, and then the functions to look up in a hash table are called hash ref. So that tells me uh, the value for x in that hash table. And um, let's see if I put something that's not there, then when I run it, I get an error. And if you want a default value instead, you can put that as an extra argument there. So since he's not in the hash table, then I get zero in this case. And some, some optional syntax that may become useful as we go along. Um, you can use map. You can write recursive functions to iterate over things. But we do have a four syntactic form. So if I want all the numbers, to print all the numbers from 0 to 9, um, then I could do this. For I, let's use, instead of numbers, let's use a list. So for each element of that list, I'll print them out. Okay. Um, that's kind of a side effect. If you wanted to take all of these numbers and square them, then you could use for slash list. So it's almost the same syntax. You just put slash list there, and it goes from being just a plain loop to being a list comprehension. So of course, you can do all of this with map, too, if you prefer. Um, another comprehension is for hash, which won't work if I give it a, a single value. I would have to say uh, multiple values. So number to string of i, say, as the key, and times i, i as the result. That creates a hash table that maps the string form of each of those numbers to its square. And there are 
roughly 2,000 other things like this, right? That you could go find in the documentation. But from the examples I want to do, these are the kinds of things we'll need. Any other questions here? OK. Uh, some higher level structuring things. You can see I've just been typing in a window and running it. I didn't save a file or anything. But sometimes you do want to break things up to multiple files. So um, I'm going to define 5 to be the number 5 and save this as um, go up a level just to keep it. Just to keep it clear, I'll call, I'll call this 5.racket. I don't want it to be a color. OK. Mm. It was a tag. What? Yes, you saved the tag of it, not the file. I, I did something wrong. Uh, I see. Okay, let me try again. That's interesting. It's confused. I'll try again. Five is five. Oh, I saved the tags. I see. Okay. So, spell it right. Uh, now, let's suppose I want to use this in another module. So, I'll make just another tab here. Um, I'll save this one right next to it as m.racket in the same file. And now if I want to get that, OK, I still didn't type right. But if you could see here, it's F-A-I-V-E. Um, so I want to import from there with my novel spelling of 5. OK. Uh, the reason it highlighted red, it says I'm not using anything from that import yet. OK, I can try to type 5 there, and it will not work still. That's because I didn't export it from the other module. So. I would write provide 5 here and have to save the file. And now when I run over here, then I can get that. So it's as easy as that. You provide with a name to export it from the module and require with some reference to the module to import. So when, it's a, when the other module is a file in the same directory, you can just write a relative path. Um, other times, like if I want the syntax parse form, then I don't use quotes. That's referring to some built-in library. Um, right? So it imported it here. I got an error because that's not, not the right syntax for using syntax bars. Yeah. Any questions there? So we'll need to make some modules and uh, imports from them. I told you that I would explain why list one, two, three prints as quote one, two, three. Um, and that is because when you put quote in front of an open parenthesis, it makes a list. And then you can put things in the list. So those two things turn out to be the same. And you can put strings in there. And now if you put an identifier like A, what happens is that A is not a variable here. It's quoted inside of a list, and so it's just literally an A. If I type quote A by itself, that'll still be quote A. So this thing, when you put a quote mark in front of an identifier, that produces a value called a symbol, which is very much like a string. just has a quote mark on the front. Um, and uh, when you put a quote mark on front of a list, in front of a parenthesis, then the quote mark automatically applies to everything inside there. Which begs the question, what if I say quote 3, and that's just the same as 3? So a quote doesn't do anything to some numbers and strings. Uh, it leaves them alone. But if I have nested in here a list containing the string apple, then it distributes over that as well. Okay. So why do I tell you about this particular shorthand? Well, it's because. Um, we're writing macros that will rep manipulate representations of programs, and that starts to look a lot like a representation of a program, right? That looks like a representation of the identity function as opposed to the identity function, right? The first one produces a list with a symbol and a list and another symbol. The second one gives me the identity function. Right? So that's why the printer prints things out with quote marks if you use some other schemes or, or lists 
that may have seemed unfamiliar at first, but it helps keep things separated out. Um, this, uh, this quote, quoted form, though, doesn't provide enough information, so that's not quite the representation we use for syntax. Uh, the representation we use for, for syntax for macros to manipulate is made by hash quotes. So if I say hash quotes, then the font didn't adjust here, but uh, if you do it on yours, then you'll see syntax, and then it has the, the lambda in there. So a syntax object is like a symbol or a list or nested lists and so on, but it has some extra information to it related to source location and uh, its surrounding context in terms of what definitions were there. So we'll need to use syntax objects. Um, I try the simplest one is hash quote A. So that's like the symbol A, but it's the syntax object that has A inside of it. And since a syntax object is something like a symbol but more stuff, you can ignore the other stuff and get just the symbol out using syntax hyphen E. So syntax hyphen E gives me quote A, because it threw away the other stuff and just gave me the symbol part. Uh, if I have syntax E of this lambda XX as you know a list containing a symbol, except it's a syntax object version of that, then that throws away the extra stuff and gives me back the list. And inside of that is more syntax objects. So I could take the first of that, which is a syntax object for the lambda part, and then I could do syntax E of that and get the lambda itself back up. You should think of a syntax object as the symbol or the list, but with extra stuff attached. And I'm, I'm not specifying the extra stuff, but it's things like source locations. So I could say, instead of syntax E, I could say syntax line here. And it turns out that'll tell me the line number where this is. The interesting part actually has to do with bindings. Um, so I'll be able to explain that a little bit more in a minute. But so the, the basic structure is the same as the quotes? Right. It's the same kind of things that quotes can, pre can produce, but every node of that quoted thing gets extra information. Okay. Any other questions here? So let's, let me show you why we have syntax objects, how we would use them. Um, let's make a macro with define syntax. So instead of define, I'm saying define syntax. And I'm going to say now, define syntax now. So I'm going to make a macro so that when I type now, um, that looks like it's a reference to a constant now, but since now is going to be a macro, it'll actually get replaced with some other expression. In fact, I'll make it be the current time in seconds, and then I'll sleep one and show the current time in seconds again, and it'll be different, even though that looked like a, a use of a variable. Not a good idea. Now is not a good idea, right? But just to illustrate uh, sort of the foundation of the macro and syntax objects, we'll do that. So define syntax is going to bind now as one of these things, and it binds it as a macro. That is, it binds it to a function that will run at compile time. So it's a function. Uh, then it starts with lambda. And then the argument I almost always call SDX, because the argument is a syntax object. The argument to this function is going to be a representation of this use of the macro. And in more interesting cases, you can pull it apart and inspect it. So there's nothing to inspect in these particular cases. Um, and so, in fact, I'll just ignore it, and I'll return a new syntax object, which is current seconds. Right? So I'm returning the macro takes a syntax object that I'm ignoring, and it returns a syntax object. So macros always take and return syntax objects. I'm just returning a constant syntax object, which represents an expression, which is a function call to the current sections, seconds function. So when I run this, we'll see some seconds, and then one second later. Okay. So it, define syntax is a bridge between the compile time world and the rest of your program. It causes, this now causes this function to be called. So if I, in here, I could say print line stx, and you'll see that uh, this macro is invoked twice, and so two little syntax objects get printed out. Right? You can't read them because they're too tiny, but it says syntax now there, just showing that it was this representation and this representation. Right? The first one here has line number 8, and the second one has line number 10. OK. So. Um, maybe I don't want you to be able to write now like this. Maybe I would prefer 
that you always write parentheses around it, and I want to complain if you don't. Right? So in that case, I want to complain about the second one. And so that means I need to look at the syntax object. So I could say, um, if we get a symbol by applying syntax E to STX, then you must have just used now by itself. And so I could complain, otherwise allow it. So the question is, what is the lambda here for? Yes. It's because uh, when I use define syntax to bind now as a macro, it needs to be a function from syntax to syntax. So I'm saying this is a function. The lambda here means it's a function that takes a, a syntax object, and then I return something. So when I apply it, I'm not applying this to arguments. I'm using now, and then that use of now gets passed to the macro. So the thing itself. Right, the thing itself. So no matter how many things I put here, what kind of structure it has, that whole thing in parentheses, that use of now, <coughs> gets passed in. And it's kind of a special case. If it's after a parenthesis, you get the whole thing. If it's by itself, then you get just that by itself. I'm thinking of macros as sort of pattern matching. Yeah, <clears throat> so we'll do pattern matching in a moment. But, but, but you, you, you're saying the whole <coughs> pattern application, the whole macro application is passed in. So That's right. So the question is the whole macro application here, the whole use of the macro, is passed as this one argument to the macro. Yeah. And, and then we can build pattern matching on top of this. Can you pass anything as a string in between, or there are some restrictions? Um, so do you mean, so up here it needs, so the question is can I pass a string or anything? Oh, down here, yes. I could provide a string. It can be. No, but you can, can you pass like utter rubbish inside? Does it pass or not? Um, so. Like mismatched parentheses and things like that. Uh, no, you can't pass mismatched parentheses here. At this level, everything needs to be a uh, well formed S expression, okay. right? Uh, to represent the use. And so, what is rec recognized as an application of now is. Uh, when it's right after an open parenthesis in an expression position. Or by itself. Or by itself in an expression position. Yeah. Those are, those are when we represent, uh, recognize now as a use. Why do we now then need now then as a syntax? Because uh, I think that would be just a policy call. So the question is, why do we need now? We don't. It's a, it's a toy example that we'll move to a better example quickly. Um, but you'll see why I don't make a better example here, because this, this was how hard it was to just check that it's, whether it's an identifier by itself. As you do more stuff, it gets very tedious to pull these lists apart, so you want some pattern matching. But what's going on underneath the pattern matching, it's good to understand that it's this. OK, yes, you're right. You, you get the error bad. That's good. I just never got around to running it. Uh, so you can see that it gave me uh, an error here with some location that was really not related to my program at all. Um, so it's better to use raise syntax error here um, and it's just better to put false there as the first argument, and then I can put the syntax object that I'm complaining about. And this time it'll highlight the bad use of now. Right? So Dr. Rackett recognizes errors created by raised syntax error, um, and it's able to look at the source location. It's on the extra information of that syntax object and use it to highlight the right place. Okay? And if you want to know more about this, you can go read about raised syntax error. Does everyone get the idea so far? Syntax E throws away the extra stuff and gives me the, the thing in the immediate syntax object. So in this example, syntax E was a symbol now. In this example, it was a list of more syntax objects. Uh, maybe I want to make sure that it's in an open paren but doesn't have anything else. Then I might do something like this. Uh, if either it's a symbol or the only other possibility is that it's a list, uh, the length of that list is greater than 1. Okay, so now it'll complain about this one with all the garbage, too, because uh, it's only happy if now is by itself. So if I fix both of these, then it's all happy. So this is already pretty tedious. Your eyes probably hurt a little bit by using greater than as, an, as a prefix operation. Uh, so I'll show you something a little crazy. What I actually do is use the infix dots like this to put it in the middle. Uh, so that means the same thing. 
And dots is an S expression level thing, so I can use it anywhere, like even in a quoted list. If I put dots around that, then that just moves the nine to the front. Okay. <laughs> so this is not very popular with everyone, but I'm showing you this because I think it helps us write a slightly better uh, macro example. So let's try a new one. Let's say I want to write things more Haskell style, where I write, um, I want to say plus one in where, um, you know, n is five. Okay. Now the problem you see right away is where is not after the open paren, right? So I can't can't use it as a trigger for my form. But if I put these dots around it, okay, now it's at the beginning because I've written the same thing really as where plus one in um, n is five. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. Really, I want the where macro that recognizes this kind of shape, although I'm always going to use it with the dots. Right. Now, I could write define syntax where and then write a function that pulls this apart and puts the pieces all together, um, and that will take a lot of code. Right? So what I want is a domain-specific language for writing these kinds of conversions. So what I want to do with where, I want to take the pieces and rearrange them to a let n is 5 in plus 1 n. So where is just an upside down let. So what I want to do is take a syntax object that looks like this and turn it into a syntax object that looks like this, shuffling the pieces around. Okay. Um, so if I use define syntax rule where, right? So I use define syntax rule and I started in open parentheses, making it a little more like a function. Actually, I'll use a square bracket, so it'll be the same. Right, so where somebody expression, and then some identifier, and some um, uh, value for that value expression for that identifier. Okay, so you can see this looks a little bit more like when we wrote define with the function shorthand, and then you you match it up with the define call. Right, so this is kind of similar. It says match the pattern like this, and then produce uh, let where id is val expr and body expert is in the body. Right. So I've got pattern and we call this a template. And this should work, they both produce the same thing. And that is because uh, this where matches up here. So body expression matches up with the plus one in, right? some whole syntax object, fully parenthesized thing, um, or something grouped by parentheses, you know. ID matched up with n, and value expression matched up with 5. And so I put n here and 5 here in the template, and body expression was the plus 1 in. Okay? If I decide I want more parentheses here, right, so that I could have multiple of them later, then I could put matching parentheses up here. That would still okay. And if I want to be able to do several of these, like I can do several of them with let. So if I want that to be the same as this, yeah. uh, now it's a little trickier, right? Uh, because I, I want any number of these things. But this, this domain-specific language for matching patterns and templates lets me put dot, dot, dot after that. That means any number of repetitions of the preceding thing. And then dot, dot, dot here says, you know, there was any number of matches to that, so make that same number of substitutions. So that'll work out the same there, too. Okay. So I'm expecting you to sort of, that's about as much as the pattern language as you really need to understand. Just right there. Right? And you'll, you'll get the hang of it by playing with it. Uh, what, if, um, what if I say where 8 is 5? Right, well, you can already see what's going to happen in the error message down there. Right? It says, let bad syntax not an identifier in 8. So it highlighted the right thing. That's because the source location was propagated all the way through. But the error message came from let instead of where. Right? And why did that happen? Well, because where just matched anything and produced a let. Why didn't it was expecting an identifier? Well, nothing said. I called it ID, but that's just a name. Right. Oh, yeah, so I eventually moved that to a let position, but, but no one ever said that that had to be an identifier. Right. So there are different 
ways of tackling this problem, different layers of, of languages. But um, this, this is an example of sometimes you need a mixture of pattern matching and template, but also be able to write code where you can write syntax error. Right? So there's, an there's a combination called um, from the syntax slash parse library. It's syntax hyphen parse is the name of the, uh, of the expression. So sorry, I'm changing this to use regular defined syntax where with no parentheses. Now I'm writing my function that takes a syntax object. And syntax parse says pattern match on that syntax object. And now I get to write patterns again. Okay. And now this thing, if I left it like that, is no good because it would be an expression. So syntax parse let me go into the pattern language. And then to go into the template language, I use this hash quote again. So it turns out hash quote uh, not only creates syntax object, it, it also cooperates with patterns from syntax parse. So putting that all together again, um, dot, dot, dot is not allowed. OK, this is a puzzling error message. Okay. Well, what really happened here, uh, if I comment that out, OK, that's an S expression comment. Okay, now I got a different error message saying syntax parse can't reference it before its definition, even though I seem to import it here. What happens is I imported syntax parse into the runtime module, but I need it for compile time code. So if I do require for syntax, syntax parse. Um, now we're getting closer. So the macro works again, gives me the same bad error message. So several, a lot of things happened here, right? Let me go through them again. I wanted to use the syntax hyphen parse form at compile time to pattern match, but still be able to intermingle that with some compile time expressions. So I had to import syntax hyphen parse into this module, but into the compile time part of this module. Then I could use that. Then I haven't really solved anything. But now I can say, unless, let's just do it for one identifier right now, unless. We have a symbol for the syntax E of ID. Then I can do raise syntax error, not an identifier, on ID. And I can even say ID within STX like that. Uh, well, ID is in the pattern world, so I need to put the hash quotes in it. So with that, then we get a syntax error here. Uh, it says question mark, not an identifier. I must have got these backwards. OK, yes. So general form and then a more specific part of the form. Um, explain the arguments to syntax parse. OK, so syntax parse is kind of like a match form. So this is the expression that produces what you want to match against. And then we have a sequence of pattern and uh, template pairs. So here I just have one possible pattern that you can match. So I could allow, if I did this, then I would also match against where with nothing. Okay. Oh. And I could say. The square bracket there says, the first part of the square bracket is the thing you're matching. And yeah, so this is the pattern part, and this is the template. So with this weird where macro, I've allowed you to just say where, and it'll produce five. And if you have more stuff, then it'll go here. But we don't want to do that. OK, and so the, the, the point here is that the error message now says where. And it says that because this syntax object that I passed to raise syntax error starts with where. What happens if two patterns match? Uh, the first one. It, so the question was, what happens if two patterns match? And then it takes the first match to, to move on, uh, to, to go with it. Uh, let's see, we can. I'm sure you have a version of defined syntax rule that allows you to define a pattern match and then have the guard. So the question is do we have defined syntax rule with the pattern matching guard? No, we usually just go on to syntax parse by that point. Okay. Yeah. Because it's so common that you have multiple cases when you start doing that, that we just move into the more compile time world. But you can imagine all sorts of things. And in fact, I mean, in fact, in syntax parse, 
if I say colon ID here, then it knows how to check for identifiers. You can imagine that's a common thing. And so syntax parse knows about that stuff, but we're not going to use it. Uh, we'll do things the hard way for pedagogic purposes. Uh, I can put define syntax rule inside of a uh, inside of a let if I want, right? And so that's just putting definitions inside of a let and then using them. And so it works the way that it should, right? A use of m expands to plus x of one. Okay, now here's a thing that will be subtle for today's purposes, but if I wrap that use of m in another let for x, if I just wrote plus x1 here, then of course that would give me seven, right? So I've got let x be five, some definition that we're not using, another let x be six, plus one to x, so that's seven. But if I say m, which seems to expand to plus x1, then it still gives me six back, right? That's because this x here uh, means that x there. Right. So when people talk about lexically scoped macros or hygienic macros, they just mean things like this work, right? right? And similarly, if I take this where macro and I export it to some other module, and then that other module let means something completely different, it doesn't matter where will still work the right way. Right? Because its notion of let that it expands to comes from this module. Um, let's see, I didn't mention it before, but you could um, just define uh, other definitions inside here. So in that case, x is shadowing. So you can mix let and define in various ways. Okay. You can also write macros that expand to definitions. So I could do define syntax rule, define five, and then some identifier, and have that expand to uh, define id five. So that if I say define five, five like that, and use it, um, then that means five is replaced by five because define five is the same as define five, the number five. Okay. Or that's maybe define random is better. So define id to be a random number. Right. So five is now a random number. Okay. Uh, what if I want to supply any number of identifiers here? So five. Apple, uh, cat, okay, so that all those are different random numbers. Okay. Then you would like to put a dot, dot, dot there, and that doesn't work because then you have more than one template. Okay. But you can use begin to group a bunch of definitions so that they go together. The begin sort of disappears and the, the definitions get spliced together. Okay. And this is something that'll be useful in our example, so that's why I bring it up. Right. So macros can generate definitions. When you use them in contexts that can have definitions, like this context or inside of a let. Right? All of this works inside here, too. Right? Except let doesn't show us the intermediate result. It throws it away and just shows us Apple. And macros can expand to definitions of macros. And there is an analog to let that's for macros. So I can say let syntax m be um, be a macro that, uh, so syntax rules is kind of like define syntax rule where you can have multiple patterns uh, instead of just one pattern. And let syntax is locally binding that. Okay, so I'll pause here while you read this and decide whether you have questions about it. Anyone have any immediate questions? I didn't talk about define syntax rules, but you can just have multiple patterns. Um, let's say if I want to allow M with an exclamation point to be 10. Okay, right? Actually, exclamation point's just a name, so what if I put false here? Still 10. Does everyone see why that is? Exclamation mark's just a name, and this is a pattern, so the exclamation mark was matched up with the false and then I didn't use it anywhere. What if I really wanted it to be exclamation mark? Well, that's what these parens are sitting here for, for syntax rules. So if I put an exclamation mark there, that means whenever I use exclamation mark, it's not a pattern variable. It's really a literal, so match it exactly. 
So now that was bad syntax, but if I use, again, a literal exclamation mark, it works. Okay. So in case we need to make some macro that recognizes something literally, uh, you can do it with syntax rules like that. Or in case you need multiple patterns, but don't really need to be in the compile time world with syntax parse in general, um, that's another use for syntax rules. All right, time for, time for you to work. Um, if you downloaded the repo, then you have outline text. I think we did all of that stuff, so go down to practice. And it says there's an objects directory. So it's too tiny for you to see probably, but there's an objects folder there. Inside of that is uh, point raw. So this uses plain racket, no macros yet, to sketch up um, a class system. Or this is a use of the class system. So inside of raw is the implementation of the class system, but you don't really care. Um, what we have is a class record constructor that takes two things, a table of methods and a table of fields. Okay. And we'll represent our table of methods using a hash table mapping names to functions. A function representing a method always takes this as its first argument. Right, so the set x method here uh, takes this and a new value for x. Um, and then it calls set field um, with this, because this is going to be the object, right? And x is the name of the field, and v is the new value. Um, I guess I should show you raw just to say. Here are the things it provides. It provides class and make object, given a class. Um, and initial values for the fields, get field and set field, which look up a field by symbolic name, and look up method, which will look up a method by symbolic name. So you can see this is making a class with these methods, which are using get field and set field. Here's a function rotate, which takes this in a number of degrees. And then it uses complex numbers in the obvious way to uh, to get new values for x and y. Um, I have the class says that there are fields x and y at positions. These are not initial values. These are positions. So here, these positions really have to be 0, 1, 2, and so on. So the table of fields maps field names to field positions. And then these arguments are the fields by position. Right? So this is all very ugly. That's kind of the point. We're going to make macros to wrap around it to look nicer. Right. This is the runtime part of the language. So make object that point class, 0 and 5. So 0 and 5 will be the initial fields. Gives me the A point object. Here's how I call set x the ugly way. I look up the set x method of A point. I have to provide A point itself as the first argument. And then I provide the new value for x. Okay. So when I run all this, uh, it produces negative 5 and 10. So we want to make this prettier. And our first stop will be to. Uh, do something better than look up method where we have to remember um, where to put the names, right? So your first task is to write the send macro. Okay, so it'll turn into send a point set x 10. You'll note there's no quote mark, right? The macro will just take that name and stick a quote mark on the front of it. Go. So this file is point hyphen send. So point hyphen send, your first exercise is to be able to click run and make point hyphen send work. Okay. And it does not now because send, which if you got the very latest I gave you as a, um, as, a, as a starting point here, sort of set you up. Send should import all the raw stuff and re-export most of it. But you don't need to export lookup method anymore because you're exporting a send macro. And here is where you write the send macro. And you don't need to use syntax parse for send. You can start out by using just define syntax rule. So I'll give it a try, and I'll walk around uh, to answer questions. Right. In about three to five minutes, we'll sync back and do it together.
I'll give you that much. So in the in the repo, did you get the repo already? Okay, so if you got the repo, there's an object subdirectory, and inside there is a point send, point hyphen send. So point raw was point raw is what you're trying to expand to. Point send is what we want to write in this next step. And but so you don't have to change point send. What you have to change is send to to fill in the macro definition of send. Oh, uh, there's a preference under editing general that says, let me try again, a preference under general, not editing general, but just general that says automatically open or open files in separate tabs, not separate windows. Uh, preferences general and halfway through the panel. So not editing general, but just general. We, we need a... We need a editing uh, general? No, not editing, just general. How do you know? Okay. Yeah, that's not very good. Oh, I should say, if you get stuck and want to want to look at the answer, there is a solution subdirectory that, that has all of these steps. So, How many of you got this far already? Okay, so we'll take our time. We've done it because uh -huh. this would actually be quite hard to change, right? If we wanted to put dot 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 here. It is. You have to do it. Well, you just have to do map or four or something. Uh, so here I would have to do. I can do this. Like. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, I so see. that gives you a list, but then you need to map this, okay, this got it. check over on it. actually gives you a syntax list, so you do syntax. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so ID would be a list. So here's yep. You don't want to close, right? When you pass it to set. That's right. Right. So what was the trick for Okay. That's a good question. What is the trick? Oh, sorry. What is the trick for turning the method name into a symbol? I'll make my sin just take one argument for now. Okay, so I want to do something here, and I want the method name to be a symbol. It turns out you can just put a quote on the front of it. So quote is really stands for a quote really stands for open paren Q U O T E space, and then put a quote after the end. That doesn't quote method name. Yeah. Well, what I mean is that quote x is the same as quot of x. And then that means this is the same as quot 
Okay, but because it's in a template, method name gets replaced by whatever. Right? The replacement is completely blind to what the non-replaced parts might mean. It's purely te you know, textual, effectively. Well, quote is not an expression yet. It's inside a template, right? After we expand this thing, then it'll be in an expression position. Right? It's because it's in a template here. Quote doesn't, quote doesn't mean quote yet. Yeah, quote, quote is just a reference to the quote syndactic form. It's not actually Right, it's like everything in the template. It doesn't mean anything until you get, get to there. I see. So you want to put this in the send file instead of point send. So just take that definition. Oh, what, uh, okay. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh. Did mm. I cut it? No, okay. It's not actually selected. It's just showing you the parentheses highlighting. Oh, is that the problem? Yeah. Great. Uh, edit. Yeah. Cut. So you want to put that in send. send. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Is zero or more? Zero or more, yes. And do you attach it directly? Or do you no, it needs a space. So dot, dot, dot is an identifier by itself. Yeah. Okay, let's look at your macro for a second. And send. Right. So you got this message was still just a name with no quote mark on it, right? And it needs to be a symbol in here. Oh, so what do I? You could literally put a quote mark there, and it'll do the right thing. But that's what we were talking about before. So it's it's, it's yes, it's, it's just so convenient that it's supported. So because quote X really means apply the quote form to x. It's, there's, it falls out from what, how quote is defined. Um, yeah. This turned out to be a better example than I thought, because it really reinforces that quote of something doesn't mean anything until it's in an expression position. Right? When it's in a template, we're just replacing identifiers with other things. I'm going to stop prefacing my talk by saying, you all know quotes really well from Westerday. <laughs> They're well understood. Well, this is about templates. It's not about quote. How many people have gotten this far now? Gotten a pattern in place, maybe with some dots at the end? Okay. How many people have given up? A handful of people. So I want to see why you gave up. Oh, okay, I see. So you want to be, yeah, okay. So I'll try to explain it better when I, when I go there. So why did you give up? Because I didn't understand the syntax. Okay. I, I would have loved if you have a, a file, you know everything you wrote, uh -huh. if you had provided a file, so uh, that I can just refer to it as an example, because after you that's gave a good it, it was point. very nice, but uh, I forgot. That's true, so I should have uh, pre-recorded pre it, except I made it up as I went, so I didn't know. Yeah. But I, should, I at least saved it, so I'll so try to bring it back. Position to say quote message, but I wanted to mean quote message, right? Not substitute for message. How do yes. I do that? Then use a different name for your pattern variable. Same as if you want to <coughs> refer to plus, don't call your function argument plus. If you want to refer to cons, don't call your function argument cons. It's the same thing. You make it sound so natural. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
I think many of you have gotten there and many of you are stumbling over basic racket things, which is fine because uh, basic racket is new here for, you, for some of you. So let's, let's try to work this out together. Um, point send. All right, so point send is this file all by itself that has this code with the use of the send macro that we want to implement. Right? So we're requiring send, which is supposed to provide us the raw classes, uh, raw class information. I mean the raw class things like class and so on, plus the send. Okay? So this point send module refers to the send module just because they're in the same directory and we use the path send.racket. Right? So that's why send is where I want to write the macro. And then let me, let me copy over an example. So this is what I want to get. This here is what I want to get. And what I'm given in the non-raw version is this. Okay, so I'm trying to convert this send form use to this expansion. Right? So we see send has an expression for the object and that's going to turn into the first argument to look up method. So we're going to have look up method with in general an expression there. It doesn't have to be the name, it doesn't have to be a name. It can be any expression that produces an object. And then we have a method name that we didn't quote and we want the method name with a quote. And so it turns out that because this really just means quote of method name Right? that it's just another set of parentheses with syntactic forms inside, um, then we can do that. Okay, but now let's see, that's this part, but there's an extra open parenthesis there. And then there's a point again. Hmm, that's that object expression. Is anyone a little bit bothered by the fact that I wrote this expression twice? Yeah. Hmm, yeah, okay, so let's come back to that in a minute, but... Um, and then we had a 10 here and a 10 here. So you could do this at first, argument expression and argument expression. Another question about a quote. Uh, is the tick syntax uh, something built into the language or is it not sort of head-on? Uh, so the question is, is, is the tick syntax built into, built into the language? The tick conversion from here to here is built in at the same level as parentheses. Okay. The fact that quote means that you get a symbol version of that, that's the quote syntactic form. So we don't have a macro that is inside the complex syntax. Uh, no, not for today's purposes. Okay. Right, no macros that are in the, the reader, the parenthesis parting, parsing part. Okay, so does everyone, uh, everyone get why I wrote that? Okay, it's not right yet, uh, so feel reassured. Uh, let's see, if we try this, then it goes okay, but it doesn't work for these because we have zero arguments here. So my strategies could be to have multiple patterns, recognize zero arguments or one argument, or allow any number of expressions here. Okay, is that clear? Is that little step clear? Dots are both obvious and potential room for confusion. Okay, they're too useful, unfortunately, to ignore. So there we go. Uh, now. As I mentioned, what if I put an expression here that uh, prints an exclamation mark before, before returning that point? How many times do you expect that to be evaluated? Twice. Right. So Phil expects it to be done twice. If you didn't know about the implementation of SAND, what would you expect? You expect one time, right? You would expect all of these expressions to be evaluated once. But so, right? I would expect zero times because program shouldn't have side effects. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, so how would we fix this? Let us. Yes, let. Uh, let's go back to send. And I want some name for the result of that expression, and now I can use the name twice. Okay? So that's a, that's a refinement to your solution, perhaps. Uh, now it's only printed once, and everything works the way it's supposed to. 
Okay, any questions here? So, yes? Uh, can you go back to the previous one? Yes. So, in use of send, uh -huh. uh, when you're using it, can you go to some examples that the send is used? Oh, uh, example of send being used is down yeah, here. Uh, so, we have here argument 90, and the other ones don't have argument, and you have dot, dot, dot. Right. Uh, can you go to definition? And okay, so this one has one argument, and these have zero arguments. Yeah. And I addressed it by adding just dot, dot, dot. So, how does it know that's that dot, dot, dot relates to? Right. So dot 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 applies to whatever is the thing before it. Before it. Okay. Yeah. Whatever it is, if it's one identifier, it means that identifier. If it's a parenthesized thing, it means the whole parenthesized thing. And it means zero or one zero or more times. Okay, right, good question. Other questions? Okay. Um, well, let's check our outline. What's next? Um, So now change send so that uh, it will disallow this, send a.10. Okay. So if you, if you didn't get this copied down, you want to start with this, uh, I'll put it up there in, uh, again in just a minute. But uh, what you want is that if I say send a.10, what happens right now? Right now I get a runtime error because 10 is not in the hash table. And I get the same thing if I say some made up name here. That made up is not in the hash table, but let's suppose I don't care about that one as much as trying to use 10 as a key in our hash table of methods. So I want to syntactically rule that out. I want a syntax error that highlights this 10 and says that's not a name. Okay. So to do that, you change just the send part here. Change just the definition of send. And you can see I've imported uh, syntax parse for syntax for you, so you don't have to worry about that. You can use syntax parse if you want. Uh, and if you want this code and don't want to type it, then you can pull it out of the solutions directory and just ignore the other half, which is the solution to right now. Did we answer your question about yes. modules and requires? Okay. Uh, to get documentation on syntax parse, it's going to be it's going to be really vast. What you want is an example, right? Yeah. Um, so where did I put that example? Yeah. So how about if I leave this example up? <laughs> but if you wanted documentation, you would click on it and hit F1. Um, Hmm? Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so that's much more information than you wanted. Message about let syntax, right? Uh, yeah, not an identifier, an expression for binding. So, oh, I know what I've done. Right. There's an extra friend. Extra set of friends, yep. as a identifier for a method, or just the fact that it doesn't exist? Make sure that it's a name. <coughs> it's a name. Yeah. Make okay. sure that it's a uh, syntactic symbol that's passed in. It's a yeah. symbol, like a... Yeah, like that. Actually, it'll be... There's already a function that combines symbol question mark with syntax E, and that's called identifier question mark. So you can use that if you prefer. So this exercise is really about transitioning from the pattern matching part to 
syntax parse and uh, the compile time part. The details of syntax parse are not supposed to be the important thing. For a, lo for a while, yeah. yeah. But as soon as you want to provide better error messages or you want to do, do more interesting things like type checking or, or build object systems, then you have to do some compile time computation. Some, so some more general. Tools won't let me do that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So is syntax parse once you get used to it, but it is a, there is a learning curve there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to do something like that. I'm going to do define syntax send. Writing an arbitrary function. Where I want a pattern match on the given syntax. Think we should work through it together now? Okay. Um, I think what we're going to do is I'm going to step through the next couple of steps and then we'll take the break. Um, so, I'm hoping you knew this was what was coming, even if you couldn't quite get the parentheses and the word syntaxes and the word parse in, in all the right place, right? But we want to find syntax sand and we're going to write an arbitrary function there. So that's why I write lambda stx. STX represents the use that we want to check. So it represents this use, like that one, send a point set x10. Okay. And we can use the same pattern that we had before. So I cut and paste the pattern. So syntax parse STX, if it matches this pattern, then we still want to produce the same result. Okay. So this is just exactly the same as the old macro written the long way. Okay, everyone with how, how many people understand this much? Even if it, even if you need more than ten minutes to type it. Okay, good. I missed the, uh, the hash quote. The hash quote here. Okay, so uh, syntax parse puts us into pattern matching automatically for the left hand side, but the right hand side is an arbitrary expression. So we need to explicitly go back to the template world, go to the template world using hash quote. We have a pattern and. And they're both in quotes, quotes, quotes. Exactly, that's right. So in syntax rule, you automatically start in pattern and you automatically start in template. That's exactly right. Okay, so um, let's see. I'm going to use that s expression comment to, uh, to comment out the first one. I'm going to comment out that one too. Okay, so with this much, um, we should get the same problem. Okay. So things worked, and we still got the runtime error here. So the part that I want to check, what is it that I want to check here? In this whole pile of identifiers, which one is the, the one that might be wrong, or that is wrong in the 10 case? Method name. Method name. So that's the one I want to be an identifier, right? Mm -hmm. So I can check that here. Uh, if um, I want method name to be an identifier, so if it's not an identifier, well, yeah, I'll write it that way. If it's not an identifier, why did I have to write hash quote here instead of just method name? Because any time you want to use a pattern variable, you need to go back to template to get, to get the pattern variable. Okay, so if what was matched against method name is not an identifier, then I want to complain. Otherwise, I can just return the template that I had before. 
And I complain by using false to mean go find the name to complain from out of the original syntax object. I will complain not an identifier. What's false for? False says I don't want to write quote send here. Um, extract it out of this, this argument here, the beginning of this argument. And then I provide method name as the more specific place where it went wrong. So the overall place where it went wrong and more specifically where it went wrong within that place. Right, and so now we get the error that I wanted. Send on an identifier, shows 10, it highlights the 10 in pink. Okay, so in a class that was longer than three hours long, what would have happened is you would have written several pattern matching macros and then, uh, then would have uh, made the transition here to general, you know, all of this is happening at compile time. Right? It happens before the module is run. Um, and also what you would do if you were doing this more for real is you would spend a lot more time with this macro stepper button. So when I click macro stepper, you start out with something that looks a lot like our source code. Right? But if you step through it and go to the end, Okay, then you get what it expands to. Okay, now this is pretty noisy because all the things you're using actually are just macros that go down to more primitive things, right? So in particular, when you have an expression sitting at the top of the module, it gets wrapped with this thing that is what causes it to get printed out. Um, and then let turned into let values, which just lets you bind multiple names on a single line. So uh, there are various primitive things, but you can see in there the expansion of the macro. And there are ways to hide um, and see just the ones you want. And then you can see where uh, this last send here, the next step is where the error message comes from. So the macro stepper helps you um, see how the program evolves and step through it in much the same way as a, as a regular runtime debugger. Right? It's just that instead of line numbers, you see the current state of the expansion. Let's see, let's take... Uh, now, let's just break now. Okay. So let's take, we're, we're breaking a little early because I'd like to break it up a little more. So let's say a 25 minute break and we'll start back at 30, 30 minutes after the hour. <laughs>